Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this very timely event on covert malign finance. My name is Amy McKinnon. I'm a staff writer with Foreign Policy Magazine here in Washington, DC. I'm joined, delighted to be joined by some of the foremost experts on covert finance from both sides of the Atlantic. And over the next hour, we're going to explore the threat that this poses to democracies and what can be done to address it. Now, I want this to be an interactive discussion, so I promise not to hog our guests' attention for too long. And please submit your own questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please include your name, your affiliation, and a note of who your question is directed to. And we'll turn to audience questions pretty early on in the event today. Um, and we have a lot of people watching and subscribed, so please get your questions in early. And also, if you're tweeting about the event, we do have a hashtag. That's hashtag covert foreign money. Um, and now that the housekeeping is wrapped up, I'm going to turn you over to Thea Tilikanen, the director of the European Center for Excellence and of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. Taya previously served as the Director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and also served as the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland from 2007 to 2008. Taya, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, good morning also from Helsinki, from our Center of Excellence. I, I wonder if our connection functions from here. I hope so. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to open uh, this joint seminar with Alliance for Securing Democracy, German Marshall Fund and the, our center on a, a particularly important topic, follow uh, the money. So we are talking about the threats uh, malign financial activity poses for democracies. And in this context, I also want to stress the importance of the recent uh, report uh, the Alliance for Securing Democracy produced on this theme, which revealed some very important shortcomings in international norms uh, and national norms and practices. So covered uh, money from the point of view of our center uh, is a key theme uh, because uh, it, it is so vital uh, for hybrid threats and how to counter them. Uh, hybrid threats uh, is a not new phenomenon in international politics, but in the current uh, global competition on power and values between liberal democracies and, and authoritarian systems, hybrid means are increasingly used. This means that the values of our societies, democracy, openness, individual rights and freedoms uh, are increasingly used against us and create vulnerabilities for our societies. Hybrid operations, again, are multifaceted processes where different unconventional means are being used to drive states, democratic societies, to make suboptimal decisions, decisions that contradict their own interests. And here, uh, different funding instruments and covert money play an important role. Uh, we tend, uh, when we talk about hybrid threats, we tend to, to divide the processes of hybrid operations into a priming phase and an oper operational phase or campaign coercive phase. And here, uh, the, the financial instruments that we talk about uh, this morning uh, play an important role uh, together with in this information in the priming phase, which uh, paves the way for a later hybrid operation. Malign funding, uh, conditionality with foreign loans, foreign direct investments concerning critical infrastructure, etc., can all be used to make a society and the government more vulnerable uh, to later foreign political, in, uh, foreign political interference, different forms of later coercive operations. So funding can be used to create proxy relationships uh, engaging domestic actors in another state to promote the interests of an external power. Covert money is also an important means to, uh, by empower, empowering uh, the right actors to increase polarization and instability. So uh, as we are doing this morning, it is important to make the funding and the dependencies it creates visible and in accordance with the recent report point out the key shortcomings in law and administrative practices. 
Here I want to stress the importance of transatlantic cooperation. It is vital. And this is also the essence of our European Center of Excellence for countering hybrid threats. Uh, so when opening this ev event now, I want to stress the importance of the topic. And once again, I want to thank Alliance for Securing Democracy for this important cooperation. Thank you. Back to you, Amy. Thank you, Taya. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Now, just for a further quick introduction on the topic, we're going to watch a short video on our panelist Josh Rudolph's recent report on covert foreign money. Four years ago, Americans had only heard unconfirmed suggestions that Russia was behind the DNC hack. We knew nothing then about their troll farms or intrusions into state election systems. This year, as we wonder what Russia might be up to, the most underappreciated external threat to American democracy is covert foreign money. Over the past decade, Russia, China, and other authoritarian regimes have funneled more than $300 million into 33 countries to interfere in democratic processes more than 100 times. About half of those cases involve Russia operating in Europe, from financing separatists in eastern Ukraine to funding big donors to the Tory party in London. And it's a global phenomenon, too, targeting Africa, North America, Asia Pacific. And it's getting worse. It used to be just two to three new cases a year, but with sweeping campaigns launched in the middle of the decade, there's now 15 to 30 new cases each year of loans to a French political party, oil profits in Italy, material support for a German lawmaker, payments to a Dutch think tank turned political party, cultivation of far-right news websites in Sweden. U.S. officials used to think this is a problem for Europe, but this year they say Russia's new tools for the November election could include three offline tactics of financial interference. They also say that Russia hits countries that have legal loopholes allowing foreign assistance. At the Alliance for Securing Democracy, we spent the past year cataloging the 100 plus cases into the seven most exploited legal loopholes, the first being in-kind donations like Russia's lavish gifts in Switzerland or package deals for African leaders. In the U.S., this loophole opens the door for intangible things of value that have been sought in two consecutive presidential elections. Next are a few types of secret conduits for political spending, like straw donors, shell companies, nonprofits. There are covert methods of funding online political ads, fringe media outlets, crypto donor bots. And lastly, of course, sometimes it's not a legal loophole, it's just a crime committed. We identified these vulnerabilities and crafted targeted policy solutions through consultations with almost 100 leading experts. Please check out our full report on covert foreign money. So having opened with that, I think it makes sense to start our panel with, uh, with you, Josh. Josh is a Malign Finance Fellow with the German Marshall Fund. Um, Josh, when I read your report, the thing that really struck me most is that, at least in the United States, something like over 80%, I think it was, of these cases of, of foreign malign finance trickling into, into the democratic process was done legally, basically, through, through legal loop, loopholes. And the video there went through what some of those loopholes were. Um, now, having kind of outlined the problems very eloquently in that video, I want to turn to talk about solutions. Could you just talk me about how you went about identifying solutions to this very thorny, complex problem? and maybe talk us through a couple of examples of what they were and, and why they haven't been addressed yet. Sure, Amy, and it's great to, to see you and in, in, in be here. So after we wrote up those case studies of the 100 plus times that authoritarians have funneled money into democracies, we dug into the financial channels used in each operation, and then we grouped them into those seven most exploited legal loopholes that you saw listed on the left in that video, and we crafted targeted policy solutions about half of which ended up mirroring or building on legislation already passed in the House and stuck in the Senate, while the other half are new ideas. We tailored them all in consultation with almost 100 you know, current and former executive branch officials, congressional staffers on both sides, um, constitutional law scholars, civil society experts. And the name of the game was to scope the solutions just right so that they close off channels for foreign financial interference without also infringing on the speech rights of domestic political spenders or jeopardizing bipartisan support. So let me just, yeah, I'll, I'll explain two of the, of the top examples. 
The first loophole in chapter one in our report is in-kind gifts, because this has been used now in the past two consecutive presidential elections. And we include it because it involves a loophole in campaign finance law. Law enforcement has effectively been allowing President Trump and, and his proxies to ask for or receive intangible assistance five times, whether it's you know dirt on opponents, investigations, hacking, black market media services, agricultural purchases in, in swing states. The Justice Department now seems to be treating foreign help as not being a prohibited thing of value if it's hard to quantify. And you know, that could be fixed with stronger enforcement ordered through either you know, a memo that could go to all the US attorneys emphasizing how they need to broadly enforce the foreign source ban. Or, and I should say it is an honor to be here with Commissioner Weintraub who has proposed an interpretive rule at the FEC a year ago that would similarly recognize the broad scope of, of a thing of value. But the most durable thing to do here would be for Congress to just write it into the statute the, the the broad definition. And I do expect that the House of Representatives uh, will introduce that in the next version of the SHIELD Act coming in, in a couple of months from now. And that bill would also address the second vulnerability highlighted in our, in our research, human intermediaries. The SHIELD Act would, would, would effectively make campaigns report to law enforcement offers of assistance from foreign powers, because we have 27 examples of authoritarians sending people on secret missions to support favored politicians. It is not limited to Russians at Trump Tower. Human operatives are actually China's tool of choice, sending straw donors through Australia and New Zealand. The biggest known case of, of foreign financial support in the 2016 election was the Emiratis, apparently funding a clandestine operation to buy potential influence with Hillary Clinton. So we have a couple of tweaks that we would make to the SHIELD Act, but the point is that it would it would address the threat by narrowly reporting campaign contacts with foreign powers offering help while protecting the rights of Americans to interact with their campaigns and the rights of those campaigns to engage in benign foreign relations. And we've got similarly tailored proposals to deal with the shell companies, nonprofits, online political ads, fringe media outlets, anonymous small donors. The last thing that I would say is that the hardest part is not coming up with these policies it's the politicization of foreign interference that has become the biggest obstacle to addressing it. Because these operations, they're meant to pit Americans against each other and get us to distrust our, our institutions. So the single strongest move that we could make would be to say that it's not about any one candidate or party or election. It's about the integrity of our democracy. It's a life or death matter of, of national security. And so it needs to come before all personal or partisan loyalties because we're all Americans. Thank you so much for that, Josh. And so staying on the topic of US elections, I wanna to turn to Commissioner Alan Weintraub. And just by way of a quick introduction, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Weintraub served, has served from the Federal Electoral Commission for almost 20 years now, um, and has chaired the commission three times for the third time last year, almost 18 years, right? Yeah. Okay, I was close. Um, rounding up. Um, so Commissioner Weintraub, I mean, you were one of the first people to really sound the alarm about the risks of, of dark money filtering into the election process. And certainly after the 2016 presidential elections, and frankly, in, after several elections that year in Europe as well, you know, no one can claim to be ignorant of this threat. But four years later, why hasn't more been done to close these loopholes? And are you optimistic that, you know, Josh, mentioned very rightly that part of the challenge of this is the underpinning uh, political dogfight about election interference. Are you optimistic that, that we can overcome that? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you to Josh for his terrific work. Uh, it's a great report and I completely agree with him that this is something that really uh, should be an issue of country over party and uh, we all should be able to agree on a nonpartisan basis um, along with, with people from countries around the world. Nobody wants somebody from outside your country interfering in your election. Elections ought to be for citizens of whatever country you happen to be living in. In my case, it's it's the United States. I don't want foreigners interfering in, in our elections. And, and I'm sure that uh, anyone from around the world can understand that and would agree with that in their, in their own countries. Um, I've, I've really been concerned about this for 10 years now. 
Ever since uh, Citizens United opened the door to corporate spending in our elections, uh, I have been trying to highlight the potential risk there of corporations being used as a venue for foreign money to seep into our election because they are less transparent, because corporations which cannot give directly to candidates or um, to uh, party committees can give to super PACs. And we have seen all manner of subterfuges in, uh, in terms of people who are trying to hide the money, trying to hide where the money is coming from using uh, a variety of corporate and LLCs and other structures uh, in order to route the money in ways that are really hard to find. Uh, just this, uh, uh, just recently, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence bipartisan um, a group uh, put out a bipartisan report, their fifth in a series on uh, Russian interference in the 2016 election, uh, in which they said the Russian government has sought to understand and potentially exploit vulnerabilities in the U.S. campaign finance system in furtherance of Russia's election influence activities. Russia's interest in this tactic is longstanding. And, the, uh, and again, on a bipartisan basis, the committee recommended that legislators, regulators, um, uh, the Justice Department, that everybody get on the same page and try and close down loopholes that would allow foreign money to seep into our system. And that I think they were probably um, thinking more in terms of actual cash uh, that may be funneled through cutouts or through um, either corporate or individuals uh, who are living in this uh, country. Um, but uh, as Josh pointed out, there's also the, the issue of in-kind contributions, another issue that I've been uh, deeply concerned about, um, particularly in, in the last few years. Uh, and. I do think that this is in part an enforcement problem. I think the law currently prohibits all this stuff, uh, but we do have an enforcement problem. Uh, I don't uh, actually, I, I and I, I know a number of other um, very smart people in the campaign finance field do not actually agree with the analysis in the Mueller report that um, kind of um, brushed this off as not worthy of um, uh, just their legal analysis, uh, brushing off this concern and saying that uh, low dollar amounts of intangibles really, you know, weren't worth pursuing. Um, uh, I th with a com the FEC has pursued intangibles, uh, in kind contributions in in other circumstances. Uh, we have pursued foreign money um, when we were presented with uh, irrefutable facts. So we had a case. Um, uh, not that long ago involving a Chinese subsidiary that was operating in the United States, but it was the Chinese directors who had plainly um, started the, the process of funneling money from, from their um, domestic subsidiary to a super PAC that was at that time supporting um, candidate Jeb Bush in the 2016 primaries. Uh, and, and the commission did act in that case because journalists had gone out and compiled such irrefutable facts that the commission really could not turn a blind eye to it. But we have um, an issue, an enforcement problem unrelated, actually we have several enforcement problems, unrelated to um, uh, foreign money in particular. And that is, first of all, right now, we don't have a quorum of commissioners to do any enforcement action. We, and that has been true for most of the last year which I think is just unconscionable. Um, we are down to three commissioners out of what are supposed to be six on a bipartisan commission, uh, and it takes four to make any enforcement decisions. So that's one big problem right now that I can't do anything about that requires action on the part of the president and the Senate uh, to nominate and confirm uh, at least one more, and I would argue three more would be good, uh, uh, commissioners so that we could be fully um, staffed and could do our job. Uh, but there has also been a longstanding resistance to enforcing campaign finance laws in general. So it's not just that people feel some kind of um, partisan pull to um, not go after particular violations, as that there has been a resistance to strong enforcement of campaign finance violations in general. And we see this um, sort of these, these combined forces coming to a head in cases like uh, we had a complaint um, again, not that long ago, um, that alleged 
that the FBI was investigating um, possible funneling of uh, foreign money through the NRA into our elections. And um, I, I could not persuade my colleagues to authorize an investigation into that. I could not even get them to make a phone call over to the FBI to find out whether they were indeed investigating this and whether they had any information for us. And uh, as I said, this is, a, this is a combined problem of resistance to initiating campaign finance investigations in general no matter who they are, um, uh, no matter who is the subject in the investigation, um, as a result of just an ideological opposition to these laws on the part of Republican commissioners. I'm sorry that this is a partisan, it sounds like a partisan issue, but it shouldn't be, but it is. I mean, that's, that's who are, that's, that's who's been blocking general enforcement of campaign finance laws, but also investigation of uh, individual complaints, as I said, unless we are presented with overwhelming evidence because somebody else has already gone out and done the investigation for us. So, um, you know, that those are uh, some of the, the um, obstacles to the kind of strong enforcement that I think is really required. I mean, we just had a new report from the Department of Homeland Security in the last couple of days, um, uh, a new advisory saying that they know that foreigners are trying to spread disinformation and uh, in our elections and specifically about our elections. And I, I really, I, in some sense, I cannot explain why every single person in the United States government is not completely outraged about this and um, doing everything that they can in order to block that kind of interference. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm hearing, listening to your response, um, uh, a lot of impetus on journalists to, to, to do their homework in, in digging up and finding the evidence on these instances. It shouldn't be the job of journalists. We are an enforcement agency. We've got subpoena authority. We've got all these great tools. But in fact, often it does come down to, to uh, journalists. We'll do our best. Um, I now want to turn and get a, uh, get a bit more of a transatlantic uh, perspective on this issue of, of foreign malign finance. Um, and I think one thing that is clear, especially reading uh, Josh's report, that the malign finance is not an issue that countries can tackle on their own. If we really want to kind of plug this global problem, it's not something that the US or individual European countries can do themselves. Um, and so I want to turn now to Jana Jokinen, who's a senior analyst at the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. Jana is a career diplomat and served for four years at the Finnish embassy here in Washington, DC as head of the political section. So Yane, how can the challenges of malign finance be addressed holistically? I mean, can governments do this on their own or do we need to involve the private sector? Are there other actors that we should be thinking about about getting on, on board to tackle this issue? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Amy, and uh, thanks for the question. Thanks uh, to the German Marshall Fund for this opportunity to uh, participate in, in this, uh, I would call this an impressive uh, panel in terms of substance, but then also in terms of having the, the commissioner um, here with us, uh, with the practical experience that, uh, that she just, uh, just shared. I'm very happy to, to be cooperating with, uh, with the German Marshall Fund and the project um, uh, Alliance for Securing Democracy. This is extremely important for all of us. Um, definitely, we need a holistic uh, approach because uh, malign financing is not uh, a separate issue as such. It's a tool. It's a tool uh, in a toolbox with lots of other tools at the disposal of, uh, of actors who seek to influence our societies. Um, um, well, their approach is holistic. Um, just thinking about the, the fact that um, it's not necessarily a particular outcome that they are seeking in our political processes, but it can be just so in chaos. Um, when at the deep level, when you look at uh, the way we organize our societies and our economies, uh, it's largely based on trust. I trust that my bank takes good care of my money I trust that the political leaders 
officials uh, act in the best interest of the country, which means means me. I trust that when I cast my vote, uh, it has the impact that uh, that I uh, wanted to have. And this is uh, what uh, the adversaries are, are trying to undermine, and they are being quite uh, good at it. Um, uh, holistically, also in terms of uh, looking at the uh, at our economies. Um, here at the hybrid center, uh, we have uh, looked at the two these two elements. So the financial economic system as a target, and the financial the economic system as a as a tool as a weapon uh, at the disposal of uh, of the adversary. And I would say that uh, you actually need to look at at this uh, in its totality. Which then also brings us uh, to the fact that uh, um, as long as you want to live in a democracy, no government can do this alone. That's a different kind of political system. We don't want to go there. That's the whole point of this exercise. So it, it is really a whole of society um, approach that you need. You need an educated uh, citizenship, people who uh, have media literacy. You need these independent institutions, like the FEC, uh, for example, but also also the media, because transparency really is uh, a major tool in our toolbox. Uh, but uh, I would also highlight the role of the private sector. Uh, so those people who are actually uh, dealing, who are at the interface between the outside influences and, and our own societies. And there are, you can go into more detail uh, on which kind of uh, persons in, uh, in the economic system are actually quite important. Uh, real estate agents uh, belong to that group. But we can go into more, uh, more depth uh, uh, during the discussion. To you, Amy. Thank you very much, Yanni. Um, we're shortly going to turn to questions. And so before we do, I just want to remind everyone to please submit your questions for the panelists using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And please do include your name, your affiliation, and to whom your question is directed. And if you're following the event on Twitter and you're the tweeting type, please use the hashtag, uh, hashtag covert foreign money. Um, so before we get to questions, I just quickly want to go back to, to you, Taya. You mentioned in your opening remarks, and this is something that was covered in a recent report by the, the Hybrid Centre, that um, one of the, challenge, the emerging challenges that you're seeing in Europe is foreign direct investment into critical infrastructure, possibly having this kind of this kind of dual use, right? Like it's, it's both an investment, but also potentially later on can become a source of, of political influence. Um, and, I'm, and I think actually one of the prime examples of that is something which I have written a lot about, which is Nord Stream 2, depending on who you talk about, right? It's a, it's a gas pipeline that's going to improve Europe's energy security, or it's a pipeline for massive Russian influence. It depends on, on who you talk to on that. Um, and so I just, you know, how can European nations individually, but also how can the European Union as a collective address this issue whilst also, of course, remaining open to foreign direct investment and open markets? Well, uh, I think uh, the European Union should really, in these kinds of, of major issues, uh, that deal with uh, the dependency of, of, of the EU and its member states uh, to try to use the collective power it has at its, at its disposal. Uh, as we know, there are many uh, processes going on where uh, the, the EU uh, tries to diminish uh, external dependencies on energy, for instance, uh, uh, other forms of critical infrastructure. It, it tries to uh, get its act together and, and, and use the, uh, the sources, the joint resources to uh, to ensure uh, the sovereignty of the EU in these, these issues. But it's also at the same time, as we know, uh, a union of, of uh, member states that have uh, different histories, different approaches to energy security, uh, energy production, critical infrastructure issues. Uh, so, uh, but I, I think uh, in, in the recent uh, environment, political in environment, there are many things uh, that stress the, the need uh, for the European Union to create a coherent, more unified policy and, and try to, to, to uh, 
take all or, or <laughs> stress its efforts uh, so that it could uh, diminish uh, its external uh, dependency. Th these are important issues, but at the same time, politically uh, quite challenging. Thank you, Thea. Um, so I'm now going to leave our panelists at the mercy of our audience. Um, and audience members, please do keep submitting your questions. Um, let me have a look here. We have several good questions. Um, so I think staying on the topic of the European Union, I think I'm going to put this one to you, uh, Yane. Um, Adrian Tudos says, are there any effective instruments to fight this threat? Should they be employed at the national level or by an overarching authority like the European Union? Thank you. Um, I think we need to address this at, at all levels. So the EU is, uh, is a special kind of uh, operating environment in the sense that you have at least three important levels. So the national level is the one that, that we are used to and where most of uh, our uh, measures take place. Uh, that's where the focus usually is. But then the European uh, level, the European Union level is extremely important. Uh, the European Parliament, its role has been growing uh, steadily over the past years, which uh, I think is, is also indicated by the fact that it is a target, a major target of, uh, of hybrid influencing, including uh, some of these money flows. Uh, but I would also highlight the local level. And this is quite often overlooked. But when you think about uh, how we organize our societies, once again, what is closest to me? the services that I use, it, they usually are at the local level. The local level also makes uh, major decisions on infrastructure, critical infrastructure, um, on, on the use of, uh, of public uh, funding. So it is definitely a target of, uh, of malign influencing a, uh, an area, a level of interest. Um, that's uh, one reason why the center uh, for uh, countering hybrid uh, influence actually cooperated with the city of Helsinki uh, two years ago. And uh, we prepared a, a report, a sort of an analysis of uh, what this would mean at the local level and what could be some of the measures to, to, to counter it. So you need to uh, look at these uh, three levels. The European level, um, as I said, is, is important because many of the decisions affect all of us. Um, and now with the uh, uh, economic crisis caused by the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there's even more money involved in this, uh, even larger, more impactful decisions being made, which then attracts uh, the, the efforts to, to influence uh, the processes, the way these financial flows are, are directed. Uh, we have well, we speaking as a European citizen, uh, so the EU has to, uh, has is is well aware of what is going on, um, and especially after 2014, there's been a lot of activity directed towards this. Um, I think the most recent, at least the most recent step that I'm aware of, is a special committee in the European Parliament that is precisely focused on on uh, foreign uh, interference. Um, including organization of elections, how to find uh, tools at the European level uh, to, to um, uh, create resilience and, and then create tools to um, counter uh, these, uh, these efforts. Thank you very much, Yanni. Um, so our next question comes from uh, Paul Massaro of the US Helsinki Commission, and this is for you, Josh. Um, he says, Josh, you make an interesting distinction between covert foreign money and global corruption in your report. And to what extent do these solutions, do solutions to these issues overlap? And, and to what extent are they the same? I.e., what's the Venn diagram between countering these issues? Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, nice to hear from you, and it's, it's a great, it's a great question, and you asked it the right way in terms of like a Venn diagram. In our research, we we differentiate a bit between corruption and what we call malign finance, and that's you know, have to be ca careful doing that because our adversaries they don't think differently; they don't think entirely separately, public-private that way. 
Um, but in terms of our, our policies and our focus and the way that we discuss this within our country, it, it is important to note the distinction between corruption, which, which its goal is making money, right? Abusing public office or abusing you know, some type of lever of power to make money versus malign finance, which the goal is political. It's, it, it's hostile, it's geopolitical. Um, and malign finance often operates through corruption through you know oligarchs and, and 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 controlled entities and companies and you know shell companies and uh, a lot of these avenues so corruption can be a weapon a vehicle for malign finance but it's it's a bit different than the particular focus that we have on political political interference um, if we didn't do that if we didn't draw that distinction and we just looked at all corruption we would have all you know money laundering and bribery and all of these things so we kind of are trying to have a focus on uh you know the, the hybrid warfare activity but but you see you know, as you say in terms of venn diagram that that overlapping area is many of the vehicles throughout all of the loopholes that we describe and the illegal activity through organized crime um is, is going to involve First and foremost, transparency, which is similar actually across some of the uh, so, so some of the the solutions. You know, about half of the of the of the solutions that that we uh, that, that we recommend involve campaign finance of one way, shape, or form. But the other half are just transparency around around media funding and corporate ownership um, and nonprofits and their funders. Uh, and so that the, the transparency would address corruption and would address these, but in kind of some different ways. And we just have to be mindful too of how we talk about corruption and foreign corruption and to not just conflate, you know, every time I've seen this argument too many times, every time you see whether it's a, you know, gun, gun rights or group or, or gun control group, whatever you don't like domestically for political purposes, you, do, you know, make allusions to, oh, well, that might be Russian money. You know, we don't know. It's all trans. You, you can't just do that. You have to have the evidence, uh, including the evidence of the perpetrator, the vehicle, and how it ultimately got to political means uh, or political ends. That's that's what our research is focused on. Um, and so staying on the US, um, I'm going to put this question to Commissioner Weintraub. Um, and this is a very good question, which I have myself wondered for many years. Um, this is from uh, Dlane Wanek of the Jocelyn Institute in Nebraska. Uh, Blaine says, I'm in the US and have wondered for years why states like Delaware, Nevada, and South Dakota allow the registration of shell companies whose ownership and funding becomes impossible to follow. They seem to be utilized by some sketchy entities engaged in money laundering, especially with regards to real estate purchases. Is this something that, oh, my question just popped away. Is this something that occurs globally? And if so, why is it allowed? Uh, well, I'm not the person to ask whether it occurs globally. Uh, it, it occurs domestically, I know, because uh, states lure um, corporate business by having lax rules. Um, I mean, that's, it's just a business decision on the part of the states that they want companies to be incorporated in their jurisdiction. They think that brings um, business and, and money into their uh, state coffers, and they are willing to have uh, rules that are going to be very corporate friendly uh, in order to do that. And I mean, the, and, and let me be clear, I'm not saying that every single corporation that chooses to register in one of these states is doing it because they're trying to hide money laundering. But uh, as the questioner uh, quite accurately points out, it does, it does open the door to, uh, to that kind of activity. And I think that there are some partial measures, uh, again, going back to Josh's theme of, of transparency, uh, there are some, some partial measures that could be adopted. For example, if you wanted to um, uh, have a negative certification requirement, where uh, if you're going to spend money in politics through a corporate vehicle, you ought to at least have to certify that none of that money is coming from a foreign source. Um, you know, whatever whatever else you may be hiding behind your corporate entity, let's at least make sure that it's not um, a funnel for, for foreign money. But this raises, um, uh, I mean, this is something that we debated at the Federal Election Commission, and um, it raises some interesting questions um, in terms of what, what constitutes foreign money. 
So if you are a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign company or a foreign individual or even a foreign government, um, there are many people in the United States who would say, well, as long as you've you know, registered the corporation and it's a subsidiary and a separate legal entity, that's now a U.S. citizen. It's not a, it's not a foreign citizen. And even if the U.S. citizens even if U.S. citizens are running the corporation, that's the domestic subsidiary, I think that one has to ask some questions about what their, what kind of directions they're getting from their, um, uh, from their owners who do come from foreign sources, uh, who do come from foreign countries. Um, I, I tried a proposal at the FEC, which I thought was a no-brainer, but turned out I guess maybe it wasn't, um, that would just seek to open a rulemaking to investigate whether we ought to block, try to block spending in U.S. elections by corporations that, while domestic subsidiaries, are wholly owned subsidiaries of foreign governments, just foreign governments. And I thought, surely there would be agreement that we would at least want to block that kind of spending in our elections from wholly owned subsidiaries of foreign governments could not get agreement to do even that. There is a, there is a strong bias on the part of um, uh, actors in, in, in the campaign finance sphere as well as in the corporate sphere about trying to keep some of these activities um, less transparent and, and not share all of the uh, internal financial details of a corporation with, uh, with the outside world. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Um, and just on our on our questioner's point about whether this occurs globally, I can just say I'm British and speaking from the perspective of the UK, London is awash with dirty foreign money, um, which has been laundered in using shell companies. The UK now has a beneficial ownership registry, which should hopefully help to curb that, but it is a huge issue. Muted myself. Um, our next question, and I'm very sorry, Finnish names are not my strong suit, but I'll try my best, comes from uh, Pavi uh, Heikinen uh, from the Bank of Finland. Um, and I think I'll put this one to, to you, Thea. Um, uh, our questioner says, as Yanni pointed out, the adversar adversaries use holistic policies to attack our societies. In Finland, which government agency would be best, uh, best positioned to take the lead in investigating and designing countermeasures? Well, I think uh, I want to, as, as Janne did earlier, uh, the Finnish uh, asset here is the whole of government approach. I think this is, uh, uh, we have a traditionally a, a model of comprehensive security uh, already before we started to talk about hybrid threats uh, and, and the way they function. We, we so strongly that the needs of security and uh, belong to the whole society, but to the whole society, but also to, to various branches of, of government. Uh, so I think uh, instead of pointing out where uh, this or that responsibility belongs, I think in the world of hybrid threats, it's very important to have a, have a, a cross governmental cooperation, to have the branches of government uh, to, to share their and their situational awareness to to monitor and share the information about about hybrid threats it is a uh, demanding uh, task uh, for small countries for large larger countries as well but but here the strength is that there is good co uh, cooperation between public and private sector private sector actors, private companies, as, as we have said uh, today many times, play a key role here as important actors. So there must be smooth cooperation, but also within the government so that we can address this, uh, this issue of uh, these issues of hybrid threats and, and uh, produce uh, a, a efficient policies to counter them. Thank you, Taya. Um, we have a question from, uh, from Rob McKinnon, no relation, uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs in Australia. Um, let me see who, 
I think I'll put this one to you, Josh. Um, uh, Rob says the focus so far has been on advanced democracies. Um, he would be interested in your thoughts on how we can reduce these vulnerabilities in developing democracies, especially um, from large scale state directed external financing that embeds corrupt payments. Yeah, great question. And, and we, look, we did look all over the world and we do have a number of cases um, in the developing world, I think first and foremost for the past couple of years has been Africa. Uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, who is close to Vladimir Putin, is operating with his wagon group, and Amy has done good good reporting on this as well throughout throughout Africa. And in some cases, so like Madagascar, where they're funding many uh, candidates and are trying to get ultimately everyone to drop out and support their favorite candidate, and they paid, uh, it seems, the the winner, who's currently the president of Madagascar. In, in many cases, countries um, don't even have laws making some, making that illegal or even like foreign corrupt practices type of legislation. So th there are, you know, in a number of cases, some just some rudimentary regulation uh, that's that's needed. There's also it's kind of a target rich environment in Africa in a bit of a similar way as as Ukraine, but you know, less important to Russia, but a, a way for them to test out new weapons. Um, in a very corrupt environment where there's natural resources that can be exploited and can be used, going back to Paul's question about corruption, can be used to pay off uh, and, and support uh, certain leaders. So a lot of activity, including in the past couple of years, that we have to pay attention to. And, and in those countries, need to work on corruption and need to, need to, um, to, to build up their, their laws. And in places where they're relatively... Um, newer democracies. So, for example, the Kremlin is now active in Georgia's election at the end of this month. Uh, you know, you get reporting, and 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 a lot of the you know it kind of goes away after a week or two with a sense of eh, uh, you know, that's what the Kremlin does. Um, in some senses, I fear that we're becoming a little bit more like that too. But the point point is that uh, you know the people have to really understand that people. In, in power, you know, real power is not in the halls of government or even, you know, military, certainly not foreign capitals. It's on the street of, of Minsk and it's in, you know, every voting booth from, from here to there because ultimately they work for us. It's a very, very powerful point, Josh. Um, we have tons of excellent questions coming in. Please keep sending them in. Um, the next one I'm going to put to Commissioner Weintraub. This is from uh, Kyriakos Revelas. Um, very straightforward question. Is the root cause of the problem not just the fact that there's a huge amount of money involved in US elections? Um, I think it's more complicated than that. There, There is a huge amount of money in US elections. Um, I, Sorry, I don't have the most up-to-date numbers. The last time I checked, there had been um, just under $3 billion raised by presidential candidates alone in, in this election. And in 2016, I think overall, the federal elections, um, you know, for the presidency, for uh, the House and the Senate, um, uh, involved about $6.5 billion, which I know sounds like a ridiculous amount of money. However, I have to tell you that I, I usually uh, check this number because it's just kind of fun and entertaining, but you know, we have our elections at the beginning of November, the end of October, we celebrate Halloween, and we usually spend more money as a nation on Halloween than we do on the election. I know that is just a ridiculous amount of candy. I don't really understand how we do that, but um, that's those are the numbers that the Retail Federation um, uh, uh, usually uh, reports. So I don't I don't know that it's the overall amount that's the problem. Uh, I think that it is uh, other weaknesses in the system. It's the disproportionate influence of very large money um, uh, donors, which is, you know, kind of a separate problem from um, but uh, from the uh, issue of foreign money slipping into the system. But, um, you know, the the questioner did ask about the amounts of money. And, and what we see is a huge disparity. There are a lot of people making very small donations, you know, $25 donations or maybe $25 a month. Some people do it on a, on a repeating basis. Uh, and then we have other people who are giving millions and millions of dollars. Um, uh, you know, in the 2000, 
was it 2016 or I think it was in 2018, there were um, roughly 126 donors who gave over a million dollars to various political committees. There were, I think, 13 or so donors, individuals or, or couples who gave over 10 million. Uh, and then there was one couple that gave $122 million. Uh, so I think that that, that kind of disproportionate um, uh, influence of extremely large donors uh, on our politics and our policies and who gets elected and what gets enacted, I think that's a problem. Uh, however, as Josh's report points out, even very small donations can be masking money slipping in from foreign sources. So I think at bottom, it goes back to an issue of transparency, of making sure that we know where the money is coming from um, and, and ensuring that it's not coming from illicit sources. Thank you, um, Commissioner Weintraub. Um, I'm gonna uh, indulge in my own question now, um, if you'll allow me. Um, and I think this one might be best for, for you, Yane. Um, you know, one of the, um, I think things that makes foreign interference, uh, at least for me as a journalist, interesting to report on is that it's, it's continually evolving. Um, you know, our adversaries are constantly finding new and extremely creative ways. Um, I had, had a story last week about how some uh, Russian trolls had, had commissioned Charlie Sheen, the actor, uh, to, to record a video to, uh, in support of a a jailed Russian political operative in Libya. Um, I didn't see Charlie Sheen ever becoming involved in this, even unwittingly, but but there we are. Um, so my question is, I mean, where do you, what do you see as the next frontier for, for foreign malign finance? Are, you know, what, are there new tools? Are there new methods? Are there new routes emerging um, that we're just not aware of yet? Thank you, Amy. This is an extremely uh, important question. Um, first of all, it points to the fact that uh, we really need to take this seriously, holistic approach once again. If our approach is, is uh, it's kind of a whack-a-mole, so when we notice a problem, an operation, we focus on that, we whack it, we are happy, but this is not the end of the story because the, the actor is still there. And the actor is constantly probing our societies for the weak, weak spots and trying to, to develop uh, new tools and new techniques. Um, what I worry most about uh, are new technologies. So small donations, for example, uh, with cryptocurrencies, as we move more towards a digital economy, it's becoming increasingly easy to mask these financial operations. So it can be, you know, it can be a $20 donation times a hundred thousand, a million with some sort of uh, AI guided system. And this all happens so quickly that uh, you actually need another AI guided system to detect what is going on. So um, the point here, I think is, uh, to really take this seriously, look at the weaknesses in our economic systems, our financial systems, in our societies, and uh, try to create resilience against these. Not by being always one step behind, uh, and technology is developing so fast that you will automat automatically always be one step behind uh, somebody who comes up with a, with a new bright idea, whether it's Charlie Sheen or, or, or whatever. Um, but really have a robust system that is able to withstand most of uh, these attacks. And then of course, uh, keep um, up your own technological prowess research. And here I come to another important point, which has sort of been referred to already. It's the international cooperation. So sharing the experiences. Uh, all of us, we tend to focus on our own situation, our own nation, national situation. We Europeans, we look at the EU. Uh, in the US, of course, the focus is on, on, on US uh, issues. Um, when many important lessons can be learned, not just in Australia, New Zealand, or, or Canada, in societies similar to ours, or Taiwan, but in Africa, uh, in Latin America, uh, 
quite often it is the same ad adversary that we're talking about. So quite often they test their techniques in the near abroad or in the further abroad before they bring these techniques to, to our societies. Um, one last re reference to new technologies, uh, the surveillance technologies that China is exporting to African countries, uh, the way that changes the mindset of uh, law enforcement, for example. I think we have a huge problem here, which just points to the fact that we really need to engage, not just amongst ourselves, talking uh, amongst friends, um, but really engage with, uh, with those outside the transatlantic uh, family. So the international cooperation, which is why the, the Center uh, for Countering Hybrid Influence exists, that really is, is the key, I think, for, for success, not trying to uh, whack each more as it appears. That will not work. Amy? If I could add a point on that, um, uh, we recently saw uh, a scheme revealed in the United States, um, which again showed the dangers uh, that are inherent in some of the um, new technologies where U.S. journalists, often, you know, not famous journalists, but, you know, people who are trying to make a living as journalists and, you know, many of them were out of work and they got these offers from um, what looked like, you know, legitimate people who were saying, yeah, we're setting up this new publication and um, we'd like you to write for it. And it turned out that the personas were entirely fake. In fact, the images, the photographs that were used were AI generated. They were, they were deep fakes. They weren't even real people. Uh, at, but they completely took in these US citizens who then started to write for this publication that was indeed set up in Russia and was designed to hide the disinformation, the, uh, the stories they really wanted to get out and promote uh, under the guise of writing some innocuous looking stories first and drawing in readership and, and getting clicks on it. And, and then they were going to try and insert the propaganda. And can I just add, we have an app for that. We, in, in the solutions. So that is absolutely, that is the cutting edge of these foreign interference operations, this intersection between info ops and malign finance. Four years ago, we saw that as ads. Right now, in the past month, it's outlets. It's a month ago, that one that you referred to on the far left. And just yesterday, you have reports of a new one, Russia operating on, on, on the far right. They're totally agnostic. They do both sides. And it, there's no disclosure requirements for media outlets to, uh, about who's, who's funding them. And generally, as a, as a society, we have not figured out how to regulate the internet in a way that would be consistent with our, you know, our ideals of an, an open system. Um, but some countries have, and we can learn from them. Iceland, for example, has the freest internet in the world, according to Freedom House. Nevertheless, in their law, they've managed to define a media outlet in a way that includes online media. This is tricky in the U.S. constitutional, uh, you know, uh, setting. But we have figured out some ways in U.S. policy for how how to deal with that. You know, so starting with ads. We have the Honest Ads Act has, you know, some real thought went into how do you do that in a way that it can be enforced and it's, it's legal, it's constitutional. And so one of the proposals that we have learns from Honest Ads to, to re require, uh, instead of ad libraries on, maintained by the social media and tech companies, we, we, we would recommend outlet libraries, whereby if any media outlet wants to use US you know, web hosting, ad tech, search engine, social media services, they would need to provide their ultimate beneficial ownership information to the US tech companies to be published in archives to be, to be maintained on, on, on those websites. So again, there are real things that we can do that we have solutions uh, if we can get ourselves to work together on it. Thank you, Josh. Um, we are two minutes away from our 11 a.m. deadline. And I fear, given the uh, the passion that you all have for this topic, if I throw out another question, that we're going to well exceed that. So I think I'm going to wrap this up here. Um, always best to leave a party on a high note. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists, Commissioner Weintraub, 
Josh Rudolph from the G uh, GMF, Taya and Yane in Finland, um, and of course to our host, the Alliance for Securing Democracy um, and the European Center of Excellence on Hybrid Threats in Helsinki. Um, and of course, thank you to our audience for tuning in, for staying with us and for all of your excellent questions. Thank you very much. Till next time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.